In 2018, Defender Publishing issued a limited release of the Defender Family Bible with expanded Apocrypha, and the response was overwhelming. Since then, we've had an onslaught of emails and phone calls begging us for a re-release, and we've been listening. For a limited time, Defender Publishing's Family Bible is back in print while supplies last. But what is it about this special edition Bible that has so many people clamoring to get their hands on it? How do the apocryphal books affect what we read in both the Old and New Testaments of the Bible? And is it possible that the very mission of Jesus Christ on earth links back to such literature as the book of Enoch? We're going to answer that question and so much more right now. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Skywatch TV. I'm Joe Artis Horn. We have an incredibly stacked panel today, and we're going to be talking about a Bible that it's very likely you've never seen before. This is truly a one-of-a-kind limited edition release. Before we get into today's discussion, let me introduce this stacked panel. He's a multi-time critically acclaimed best-selling author and CEO of Skywatch Television, Dr. Thomas Horn. Good to be here. She's a legend and pioneer of podcast, radio, Christian television personality, and best-selling author of the Red Wing Saga, Sharon Gilbert. His broadcasting career has spanned for more than 40 years. He's the best-selling author of the groundbreaking books, Last Clash of the Titans, The Great Inception, and The Second Coming of Saturn, Derek Gilbert. She's a credentialed, ordained reverend with a degree in Bible and theology, a powerful voice in Christian television, Donna Howell. And she's the host of the popular Christian television program for women, The Simply His Coffee Shop. Please welcome my beautiful wife, Catherine Horn. Is it possible for me to be in the center of more intelligent people? <laughs> I think not. So, Tom, you know the history of the first time that you printed a Bible that was actually less decorative than this. It had a blue cover since then, and I'm going to do some reps during this program today. This is a massive, so for scale, this is my fist. I don't know if you can see that. This is a gigantic living room centerpiece. Yeah. It's really a conversation starter. This behemoth called the Defender Family Bible Limited Edition King James Version with Expanded Apocrypha. And again, I'm going to get my <laughs> exercise in today one way or another. <laughs> you know the history of the first time you published a King James Bible with Apocrypha. And when you did it, at the time you thought it would be the last time you ever did it, this time, no hyperbole, no attachment to history revisionism because of the cost, the industries that have changed, the, the difficulties we're having with publishing, the cost of glue, trying to get paper. Um, I can tell you with certainty, we have no plans to re-release this again. There's a finite number of them. So, so again, while supplies last, we've got a very special opportunity for you to get your copy of the Defender Family Bible. But what made you even come back to the table and do this one more time. Yeah, and I'm glad you said that it's a limited time because I suspect that over this week and next week, we may sell out what we have. We could just run out. So if a person wants this limited edition Bible, it's a real collector's item, and they're going to get it for pennies on the dollar, right? We're going to um, reveal that in a minute. Yeah, it's they, it's they, crazy. They, they're going to need to do that as soon as they watch the program. Don't <laughs> let any grass grow under your feet because when it's gone, we really are not going to publish it again. No plan to ever do that again. Why did I create this Bible? Well, as you all know, in 2011, our historic farmhouse outside of Crane, mm -hmm. Missouri, burned to the ground. Right. Yep. And everything that was in it was lost, including a library that I had been building and honing for <laughs> literally decades. Yeah. Well, your whole for life. 40 years. Right. A very and, valuable library. Yeah, th yeah, this had a lot of collector mm -hmm. books in it and stuff yeah. that I was able to get through antiquities and things like that. Anyway, there, boy, I found out that old paper really burns good. <laughs> um, and uh, so then what happened was... We moved into town for a little while and rented a little house. Anita and I would have a place to live. 
while we rebuilt the house mm -hmm. that had burned down. And one day, I mean, you would think this would just be on my mind, but it wasn't. One day I'm in there and I'm studying something. I'm sitting at my computer and I think, oh, yeah, I need to reread that. And I go to reach for the, the old, book of yeah. Enoch and wait, wait, I don't have the book of Enoch. I don't have the Apocrypha. Right. I don't have any of these ancient texts uh, that I once had. But then over the next few days, I got to thinking, you know, if these books are that important to me, and here's the other part of this, you need to make sure that you have uh, good quality versions mm -hmm. of these old books. When you get them, they need to yeah. come from right. a university level because so many of them that are on the internet have been junked up. People have written their own yeah. stuff into it. They've admitted st uh, omitted stuff they didn't like. So you can't trust the ones that you can view online often. Mm -hmm. And so we went through the process of getting all of the best versions like from Oxford and other places uh, of those books and we decided to put them in print because I got to thinking, well, if, if those books are that important to me, right. they would be important to a lot of yeah. other sure. people. Yeah. And so then we decided to do something that had not been done in probably 200 years, and that is to create a version of the Bible with a back section that actually has the expanded Apocrypha, the additional uh, books. This was something that used to happen. 200 years ago, oh, yeah. Protestants and Catholics, mm -hmm. they published the Apocrypha in the back of their Bibles, and then slowly but surely it fell out of favor. You can also see there in that red picture, letter. there's yeah. Oh, yeah. Red, red letter edition. That's why that happened. That's why I decided to publish a Bible like not had that that had not been done for 200 years uh, that had the expanded apocrypha in the back of it so that everybody would have access to it the other thing is this book this bible by itself would sell in retail for probably around $200. And we're basically giving it away in this limited time offer. Right, no, that's true. If you go to a Bible bookstore, it's not uncommon at all to see, you know, modern NLT study Bibles, 89, 99. Oh yeah. Um, easily, when you, know, you get easy, to an expanded it's... that's got a hardback cover, that's a family Bible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, no, and it totally is. In fact, we've got a little treat for the viewers at home. I'm gonna put up some B-roll video footage of you and mom in the 80s during your first ever uh, appearance on the 700 Club. <laughs> with, with a family Bible that you're sitting on the couch reading, you're probably watching it now, that very much uh, reminds me it's of... It's what inspired me. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it inspired the cosmetics of the front, you know, this beautiful picture <laughs> of Jesus being depicted on the front. But um, no, it, but this one's larger. I mean, this, believe it or not, this one's actually larger than the one that we had growing up. I want to shift gears, Donna, because Tom's talking about the book of Enoch. He's talking about these apocryphal books that meant so much to him. And I know that you've been through a lot of divinical training. Um, translations are important to you. And there's a lot of talk about the book of Enoch, but the Apocrypha collection includes a lot more than just this one book. This right. Bible includes several different books. What are some of the other books in this Bible, and how are they valuable in terms of a companion alongside the Word of God? The first thing we need to keep in mind is that when we turn the page from the Old Testament into the New Testament, it's very easy as a reader of the Bible to just turn the page and go, this is what happened next. But that one turning of the page represents a 400-year era of silence where mm -hmm. the prophets were no longer speaking and the, the you know Jesus had not yet come there's a 400 year period it's called the intertestamental period or the second temple era now this particular era is so crucial because it sets the bar, it sets the precedence for how all of new testament scripture is going to be written in other words, what the Jews believed at this particular time is what the Jewish writers of the New Testament was getting ready to write. That what everything they wrote in the New Testament stems from the world view mm -hmm. that is shaped by this literature. This literature of the intertestamental period is extremely crucial to how we read the New Testament. This is a period where there was all kinds of religious and political revolts happening, warring between the, the politics and the religious people. For instance, we have a Maccabean, Judas, the son of Hezekiah. He went against Rome in 4 BC and 2,000 rebels were crucified. Wow. 2,000 oh, wow. rebels mm -hmm. were crucified. 30,000 were sold into slavery. 
And this happened in a city called Sephoris, which was in walking distance from where Jesus grew up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in the same year, the same year, two other revolts, uh, Simon of Perea, he crowned himself king when King Herod died. He burned down the palace at Jericho. He and all of his followers were beheaded or scattered. Mm -hmm. Um, Another shepherd came along by the name of the Throngus and his four brothers. When, When they went against Rome, it was during the week of Passover and thousands of Jewish pilgrimers during the holiest week of the year, thousands of them were massacred, slaughtered. So you look at all of this stuff that's going on right at the moment that Jesus comes into the world. You have to understand the writers of the New Testament were not just sitting there responding to Old Testamenty, spiritual, holy sounding words. They had a worldview that was not only sharpened by this kind of revolt and happening by this kind of tumultuous behavior around the time of Christ's birth, they had an Enochian literature worldview that the book of Enoch and other apocryphal literature helped them to develop this worldview. So the Maccabean and the Hasmonean revolts, that's just one little tiny, tiny, tiny part of the intertestamental or second temple era literature that is put into what we collectively call the apocrypha, right? These uprisings changed the religious and political view and therefore changed everything we read about in the New Testament. But there are more than just that. So that's just the Maccabees. All I've covered is just the book of Maccabees, right? Wow. First and second book of Maccabees. That's only two books in the Apocrypha. We also have the first and second Esdras, which they're kind of like a a different approach to the return of Zion, which actually several of the uh, church historians, including Josephus, believed the book of first and second Esdras to have been inspired by the Holy Spirit and considered scripture. Oh, wow. There are other wisdom books like Ecclesiasticus and the Wisdom of Solomon. Those actually uh, kind of parallel what's going on with Ecclesiastes and Proverbs. Mm. There's Judith, which is a little book similar to Esther, another story of a woman who really, really played an insurmountable role in leading the Jews to victory during the time of the war with the Syrians. There's the prayer of Azariah. Mm-hmm. If you understand, when you read the book of Daniel and you see these, these men in the fire, the prayer of Azariah is a prayer uttered, and I quote, in the midst of the fire Mm -hmm. by another one of Daniel's friends. These are books included in the Apocrypha that we don't even understand the way that the New Testament writers did. But if you're gonna read the New Testament, you have to understand that everything you read from the New Testament are written from people who understood and interpreted the ways of God and the will of God through this kind of literature. Right, Mm -hmm. right. The history of that period, that so-called silent four centuries, I think we'll find, and we'll we'll discuss this over the next uh, program or two, uh, not so silent after all. No. Because you talk about the political and the religious infighting that was taking place, and it wasn't just the Roman Empire rising up and destroying what was left of the Empire of Alexander the Great. And of course, Judea was a key battleground in that uh, that struggle. You had the, uh, the Syrian remnant of Alexander's empire fighting the Egyptian remnant, and then the Romans coming in in the second century BC, and then you had the nationalist revolt of the Maccabees. Uh, but you, then you also had a split between the, uh, the Jews who were returning from Babylon in the 4th and 3rd centuries BC and not really happy with the priesthood in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So you had a split between the Anakians and the Zadokite priesthood who controlled the temple. And that was a fundamental difference in worldview where the Anakians were looking for the return of a Messiah to put things right. There's nothing we can do. The world is made impure by the sin of those fallen angels. And that's, you know, first Enoch. Mm -hmm. Whereas you had the priesthood in Jerusalem saying, no, no, we've got this. As long as we keep doing the rituals, it will all be fine. And then that further split and to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes who came out of all of this. And so you're, you're right. There was a lot in play there that was very much familiar to the apostles, to Jesus, and the people who they were teaching in the first century AD. Yeah, so in the very same way that you cannot understand American history, um, you can't understand what, what was motivating George Washington to do what he did, the battles they fought mm-hmm. over liberation from Britain. You can't understand our history unless you understand who these players, the wars, the battles, yeah. the politics, mm-hmm. the religion. So in the same way, there's much of the New Testament and some of the Old Testament you can't understand unless you're also fully aware of what is in the Apocrypha. Exactly. 
the late Dr. Michael Heiser said a wonderful phrase one time. He said, guess what? The apostles read books. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> Wait a minute. I know. So they were aware of all of these books, and they had studied with some of the Essenes that Derek will talk about in the next show. Now, one of the things that people might find fascinating, Tom, you know, you've spent decades talking about transhumanism, forbidden technology, artificial intelligence. You were talking about this, you know, when I was a kid, <laughs> and, uh, you know, none of my friends could identify what you were talking about. <laughs> of course, I was, well, I was not, a news for you. Most people today still can't. Well, does the book of Jasher, from this Defender Bible with expanded apocrypha, possibly speak of high technology being used by fallen watchers? to manipulate the genetic makeup of men and beasts. Yeah, I know this was interesting to me when I was reading again through all of these ancient texts. And for some reason, I had read right past this uh, in the book of Jasher, but it, it has the most telling extra biblical script, if you will. And by the way, the, the book of Jasher, which is included in this apocrypha, is quoted in the Bible or referred to in the Bible in Joshua 10, 13, and again in 2 Samuel 1, 18. So there again, they, the ancients were aware mm -hmm. uh, of this book. But Jasher, now Jasher records this familiar story of the fall of the watchers, much similar to kind of like what Enoch did. But then he adds this exceptional detail that none of these other books are unequivocal about. And it's something that I think can only be understood in uh, reference to like biotechnology or genetic manipulation or transgenic sciences. Oh. Because here's, here's what it says in Jasher 4.18, after uh, the uh, watchers had instructed humankind in the secrets of heaven, it says, <laughs> then he says then, then the sons of men began teaching the mixture of animals of one species with the other in order therewith to provoke the Lord, end quote. Now that's important because the phrase here, the mixture of animals of one species to the other would not be talking about hybridization. Right. Because God made like animals, like yeah. horses can breed mm -hmm. with zebras mm -hmm. and donkeys and whatever. Right. So this would have been referring to something entirely different if we're mm -hmm. talking about mixing a horse with a human in order to create a centaur. And that definitely would have provoked the Lord because sure. we're talking now about crossing over species barriers, yeah. one species with another kind of uh, species. So, and it makes me wonder if this isn't kind of its own little seed, a little subtle commentary that actually is talking to the much bigger picture of all the mythological entities. Some of the early church fathers writing about they tried to make men with wings and they're mm. doing all this stuff, yeah. right? Well, you know, I think you may have the answer there because even today, scientists who are trying to figure out ways to clone human beings, sometimes they are mixing species. It doesn't work out, but they're trying to mix species to see if there's a way to uh, enhance the capability of cloning. There is a natural barrier in place that God has put mm -hmm. to keep that from happening. Mm -hmm. It's why it yeah. doesn't naturally occur. So right. that would be the secret yeah, the of secret. heaven, the secret that mankind wasn't supposed to have. Right, yeah. So you don't, a dog can't breed with a duck. No. But when the watchers were around, they could. Well, it wasn't really breeding. But it's genetic manipulation. It had but that, to be. Th so think about that. You have thousands-year-old book, right? Literally using language that could only be talking about high levels of biotechnology. Wow. Right. And that's just the book of Jasher, which is in this limited edition yes. Bible. But <laughs> I want to I make sure everybody's clear. Now, Tom, your opinion, though, despite your intrigue with the book of Jasher, is that the book of Enoch is actually the most important of all extra-biblical, non-canonical books, correct? Yeah, it is. And I'll give you the answers real quick because I know we're running low on time. And Donna and Derek could also weigh in on this and Sharon. Enoch's important to me, number one, because it was very important to the ancient Jewish communities from mm -hmm. which Christianity uh, sprang, as well as the early church fathers, many of them. Number two, it provides the worldview that the Lord's disciples were applying to the coming of the Messiah. Messiah. Yeah. Number three, this is where the Savior, the coming Savior, the Messiah is called the Son of Man. Yes. Right. Yes. And this right. is the title that Jesus took to himself yeah. so that his Hebrew followers would understand that he was the fulfillment as prophesied from the book of Enoch. Mm -hmm. They were very much looking forward to that. Number four, it's quoted in the Bible. 
So yeah. if the Bible quotes it, I can probably quote it, right? Fragments of it were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls where the Essenes, the, I think the most accurate prophets in history, uh, kept them at Qumran. And then to go ahead with what Sharon was saying, I believe like Dr. Michael Heiser, you can't understand especially much of the New Testament, right. if you're not familiar with the story of the book of Enoch. And then I'll say this final thing, Joe. It was read in the first century church, and for at least 700 years following that, uh, it was read in all congregations and studied and memorized by scholars yeah. and lay people. And even today, if you take university studies like uh, Donna has college level classes, often these apocrypha are required reading. Yeah. You have to read them because you right. can't understand what the professor's trying <laughs> yeah, to teach you exactly. unless you have that knowledge. So once again, that's why we've created a book that hasn't been around for 200 years with the expanded apocrypha. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we want to make sure that you know how you can get your copy of this incredible one-of-a-kind Bible with expanded apocrypha in the last chance Defender Bible package. Right now, while supplies last, we're offering this giant limited edition Defender Family Bible for your donation of only $35 plus shipping and handling. But if that wasn't enough, we're also including the Defender Publishing's 120 ebook collection absolutely free. Now, this data DVD library collection includes 120 of Defender's all time best selling books featuring authors like Dr. Thomas Horn, Derek Gilbert, Carl Gallup's <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Robert McGinnis, Sharon Gilbert, Allie Henson, Donna Howell, Terry James, the late great Michael Heiser and so many more, too many to number. This DVD library also includes the limited edition Defender Bible with expanded apocrypha and all of these books in this collection come in popular ebook formats so you can read them on EPUB, PDF, Kindle, and other handheld electronic devices. It's devices of your choosing wherever you go, including the Bible that we're talking about today. These items hold a retail value of $1,400. If you had to buy all of these eBooks separately, yours now for your donation of only $35 plus shipping and handling. So don't delay. You can scan the QR code on your screen right now using the camera app on your phone for instant access to this special offer. You can also visit us at skywatchtvstore.com or call 1-844-750-4985 and ask, for the last chance Defender Bible package right now. This would make a really, really amazing Christmas gift to you for all of the people in your life that love to do research or your pastor. So buy it now and save it and give it to them for Christmas. Oh, that's a great, yeah, idea. That's a great idea. Just stash it somewhere. Yeah. With just a couple of minutes left on the clock, Tom, how were the books of our modern Bible, the canon, chosen while others were rejected? This is a question that comes up a lot. Yeah, and uh, really it's kind of a complicated answer, but I'm going to have to just make it very quick because we don't have a lot of time. The 66 books in our modern Bible, what we today call the canon, 39 Old Testament books, 27 New Testament books. These were chosen throughout church history and primarily by using five different uh, guidelines to determine if something was actually divinely inspired. Number one, was the book written by a prophet of God or an apostle? Number two, was the book confirmed by acts of God? Number three, did its message tell the truth about God? Number four, does it come with the power of God to transform lives? Uh, so now we understand and it's actually a living uh, entity. And then number five, was it accepted by the people of God? Okay. Uh, now that fifth one took some time because it wasn't really until the fifth century that most Christians agreed on what those 66 Bibles would eventually become. And some people would find it interesting to know that during the different church councils and synods, and they were working this all out, there were several of the books that are in the Bible that almost were rejected. They almost right. didn't make it. Hebrews, Hebrews. almost didn't make it. Why? Because the authorship is uncertain. And furthermore, it might have been written by one of those women apostles that Ooh. Donna Howell has so famously wow. <laughs> talked about. The book of James 
was almost omitted. Why? Because some argued that it argues for salvation through works. <laughs> Furthermore, the book of Jude was almost admitted. Why? Because it quotes the book of Enoch. There you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, and some wow. people had uh, problems with wow. that. Now, there are churches today in America, the Catholics, the Greek Orthodox Church, that have some of the Apocrypha uh, in their Bible to this day. Mm-hmm. It was very common hundreds of years ago mm-hmm. that both Protestants and Catholics published Bibles like this, mm-hmm. where in the back section of it, it had the Apocrypha in it. And those Apocrypha, by the way, the same way we think of them today, they are not divine scripture. That's why they ought to be separated in the back of the book. They're important history, but we do not say that they're canon. We don't argue that those happen to be scripture, but nevertheless, they're in there and they're helpful for us. Some of the books that are in the one that we've published is the book of Enoch, the book of Jasher, book of Jubilees. Donna earlier was talking about first and second Ezra's, first and second Maccabees. Mm-hmm. So it's the full expanded version of the Apocrypha uh, in this Beautiful, Mm -hmm. beautiful Bible. Tom, with about a minute on the clock, how did the Enlightenment period cause the church to slowly abandon the Book of Enoch and these other apocryphal pieces of literature? Yeah, the Enlightenment or the Great Age of Reason, uh, this this defined a period during the 1700s and 1800s across Europe that Mm -hmm. eventually made its way all the way over into the West. They were trying to get away from the supernaturalism of the Bible. And in fact, they really disliked the Book of Enoch because they were embarrassed by the story of angels came down and mated with women. And then they had gave birth to giants and other mutations. And they just, the, you know, the, the so-called age of reason, they became unreasonable. Mm. <laughs> and little by little that infiltrated the whole church. And so the book of Enoch started falling out of favor and some of the other books. And little by little, they quit publishing them in the back wow. of their Bible. It's true. Genesis 6 had a supernatural interpretation worldwide and globally until the 4th century. Mm -hmm. We were never going to have enough time to do it all this week, guys. But join us next week when our guests return to reveal the astounding links between the ministry years of Jesus Christ and the details foretold of him in the Apocrypha. We're going to do it right here on Skywatch TV. For everybody here in studio, everybody on panel, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Joe Horn. Keep your eyes on the prize, which is Jesus Christ. We'll be back. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we want to make sure that you know how you can get your copy of this incredible one-of-a-kind Bible with expanded apocrypha in the last chance Defender Bible package. Right now, while supplies last, we're offering this giant limited edition Defender Family Bible for your donation of only $35 plus shipping and handling. We're also including the Defender Publishing's 120 ebook collection absolutely free. This DVD library also includes the limited edition Defender Bible with expanded apocrypha, and all of these books in this collection come in popular ebook formats so you can read them on EPUB, PDF, Kindle, and other handheld electronic devices. These items hold a retail value of $14. $1,500 if you had to buy all of these ebooks separately. Yours now for your donation of only $35 plus shipping and handling. So don't delay. You can visit us at skywatchtvstore.com or call 1 844 750 4985 and ask for the last chance Defender Bible package right now.